Well, according to my watch, it is now four o'clock. So we'll get started with our virtual bio blitz, The Other Songs of Spring. So this is on frogs and toads. Um, I'm excited because I really love frogs and toads. They're one of my favorite spring sounds. Uh, but if you think of a frog and toad, what is the one word that you can use to describe that frog or toad? So feel free to put into the chat, what is that one word that you would use to describe a frog or a toad? So you did give me a couple of words to describe frogs and toads. There are many, many more out there, but I love the words that you gave me. Moist and ribbit are two that are definitely in this word cloud. Uh, so why should we care about our frogs and toads? Well, a third of our frog and toad species worldwide is extinct, threatened, or of special concern. So they are definitely declining. And in Michigan, we actually have four frog and toad species that are under threat, uh, three of which are of special concern. One is actually threatened in the state of Michigan, and that's Blanchard's cricket frog. And we'll talk more about these in just a bit. The main threats to, our, threats to our frog and toad friends, uh, lots of different things, climate change being one, habitat fragmentation, so destroying of their habitat, definitely pollution, invasive species, disease, there are so many different things. Uh, they're kind of like those canaries in a coal mine. If something's wrong in their environment, they'll let us know because they'll start declining. So why should we care about them? Well they give us lots of great things. As I said, they're that canary in the coal mine. They tell us how our ecosystems are doing. They give us medicines. Uh, they help keep our water clean, especially those tadpoles eating algae. Um, they're part of the food chain, not only as predator, but also as prey. Uh, and they keep our mosquito populations down. So if you don't like mosquitoes, which I don't like mosquitoes, um, they eat mosquitoes. And so by keeping those populations down, they also keep those diseases in check. So there's lots of great reasons to care about frogs. I love this cartoon. Hey, you're a toad, right? No, I'm a frog affected by chemical pollution. So what are frogs and toads? Well, they're in the scientific kingdom Animalia. So they're an animal. Uh, they're in the phylum chordato. Basically means they've got a backbone. Just like we've got a backbone, they have a backbone. They're in the class amphibia, and there are actually over 8,000 species of amphibians. And that includes not just frogs and toads, but also salamanders and many other things. Uh, so to be an amphibian, you have to have a few characteristics. You have to be what they call ectothermic or cold-blooded. Uh, now that doesn't mean that your hands are always cold like mine. That just basically means that you can't regulate your temperature as well as we can, as humans can. So basically, if it's cold outside, you'll be feeling cold. If it's warm outside, you'll be hot. So they lack that internal temperature regulation. They also have moist skin, as somebody said in the chat. Moist is one of those characteristics. So they don't have any hair or fur. And a lot of times, their skin will be kind of smooth as well. They have lungs, but they also can breathe through their skin. Um, and when they are in the tadpole stage, they have gills. Amphibian actually means double life in Greek. So they will not only live in the water, but they'll also live on land and they'll go through that metamorphosis. And this is also things that we learned way back in probably elementary school, maybe even preschool, right? Um, so our life cycle of a frog or a toad, they breed, lay eggs, usually in the spring, early summer. Usually the males arrive first to the breeding sites. And that's what we're hearing right now because they are calling to attract those female frogs or toads and to defend their territory, say, this is my area. Uh, then the females will lay eggs in the water, uh, which are then uh, fertilized by the males. So that's our life cycle. Uh, so where do they live? Well, in Michigan, they can live in many different places. Swamps, marshes, fens, bogs, ponds, vernal pools, ditches, urban wetlands. Basically, the differences in between these are what type of vegetation they have, where does the water come from, but they need a wet, moist environment in order to live. 
And one such place that we're finding them right now, quite a few of the species are our vernal pools. So we did a, a program about that a few weeks ago, but they look kind of like a muddy or a wet pool in the spring. Uh, summer, they tend to look like a muddy spot. Fall, they may look like a smaller pool, uh, but these are really important places for our frogs and toads. So they are in the scientific order, uh, excuse me, one specific scientific order. There's about 7,000 species of them in this order. And so in Michigan, we actually have 14 species of frogs. Now there is some debate of frogs and toads. Uh, some people will say 13, some people might say 12. Officially, we have 14 species. Uh, they're within three different families, scientific families, the true frogs, the true toads, and basically the tree frogs are the three different families. And I'll tell you which species that people debate on whether they are part of those 14 species in Michigan or not. But before we go into each individual frog, I felt it might be good to talk about what is the difference between a frog and a toad. Now, we've two of our families are in the frog family, one is in the toad. If you're a group of frogs, for some reason, it's called an army. If you're a group of toads, it's called a knot or a nest, probably on how they all group together. So the differences between frogs and toads, one is in their egg mass. So if you're a frog, you've probably seen an egg mass that looks a little bit like this, like a clump of jelly, gooey stuff, that would be your frogs. If you see more strings, that would be your toad. So that's one difference where they live. So I said, all frogs and toads like to live in moist environments, but toads can live a little bit farther away, can go more into the prairies, can go more into some forested areas. Their skin, frog skin tends to be a little bit more moist, a uh, little bit smoother than toad skin, which tends to be a little bit bumpier, more warty when you think of that. Uh, their feet, frogs, because they live in more of that moist area, uh, sometimes will have webbed feet. Not always, but sometimes we'll have more webbed feet. Toads don't tend to have webbed feet. Their body shape, frogs tend to be a little bit more narrower in their shape, whereas toads tend to be more stout, a lot more stout, uh, squished out. Their legs, frog legs tend to be longer than toad legs. Um, and for the reason of that, well, is their movement. Frogs tend to more leap, uh, whereas toads tend to do more short hopping or crawling. Other features that you want to look at when you look for frogs and toads. Uh, if you're looking on frogs, you want to look for some ridging or some folds on their back area. Those are called the dorsal lateral fold or ridge. And we'll talk more about those on how to tell the differences between particular toads and frogs. They're a really good identifying characteristic. Um, one of the others I said talked about webbing. There is also their ear, um, whether they have that basically round circle that you see right here, whether they show that or not. And also their size is a really important factor in identifying frogs and toads. Because here in Michigan, some are really, really small. Uh, so size of a, maybe a penny or the top of a milk jug cap. Others are maybe more of a, basically a Coke or a soda cap all the way up to a baseball size. So this will be your tree frogs and your pickerel frogs or your wood frogs. Uh, green frogs uh, and leopard and American toads tend to be anywhere from the size of probably like a tennis ball to the size of a drink lid container. So definitely some differences in size. Your largest frog or toad will be your bullfrog. So those can get up to eight inches long. So quite a big difference between that eight inch long bullfrog or that really big bullfrog and that chorus or frog or spring peeper, which is the penny size. Other defining features in our frog and toad friends, more in our toads, they're gonna have more crests uh, right above their eyes. So this is looking at the back end of a toad. So if you look on the other side, um, you're gonna have some crests, you're gonna have basically what they call these glands, the paratoid glands. Uh, these are more of their poisonous glands. So if something was to eat them, uh, this could help protect them. 
and some ridges also on the back here, but more behind their head area or their shoulder area than ridges that go all the way down the back, which would be on the frogs. Another identifying feature or characteristic in frogs and toads are their vocal sacs. Uh, so this is what helps them actually make those sounds that we're going to listen to and learn in just a bit. But you might notice just in these two pictures it might look like they have two vocal sacs or they come off the side or one straight in the middle. There are also different shapes of vocal sacs all throughout the world that can help us define what type of frog or toad it is. I like this one here. Looks like uh, the balloon blew up around its head. Uh, nice and big right here, a little bit more under, not as big. So they can have lots of different shapes in their vocal sacs. And the way they sound, well, ribbit, croak, peep, trill, twang, snore, chuckle, lots of different sounds they have. Um, and the factors that influence those sounds or those calls well, one factor could be the time of year. So is it a time that they're calling? Is it a time they're breed, uh, breeding? Uh, is it the time of day? For example, usually peaks after sunset when you're gonna hear more calls and by midnight, you're probably not gonna hear many more calls. It could be, where are they in the state of Michigan? So if you're in the lower peninsula, you might hear different things than if you're in the upper peninsula. It can vary uh, by temperature. So the lower the temperature, the slower the call. So they're a little bit colder. Uh, and also it can vary by precipitation. So it'll actually increase after a rain as well as the size of an individual. So a bigger the individual, maybe the lower the call or the long, uh, louder the call. As I said, we have 14 different species. So we're gonna go through our species by family. So I'm, I've grouped these by family and also kind of by what are the lookalikes within these families. So we're going to start off with our true frogs or our typical frogs. These tend to have smooth skin, no bumps, no warts. They tend to be more large or broad mouthed, webbed feet, powerful hind legs, and they tend to move more in those long leaps that are typical of frogs, true frogs. All right, so our first one in this group are our wood frogs. Uh, our wood frogs, about one and a half to about three and a fourth inch. Um, so they're a smaller frog, not as small as our spring peepers, uh, but they're on the smaller end. They tend to prefer our vernal pools. So these are the frogs you're really gonna find in those vernal pools, lots of those wet areas. They're breeding that you should have heard them more in March and April. They're, we're kind of getting out of the season for hearing our wood frogs right now, but you still may hear some of them. Uh, unique markings for these guys, they look like they're almost wearing a mask across their eyes. And you can kind of see it here in this picture. It's kind of a dark line. I'm not gonna give colors on our frogs and toads. A lot of frogs and toads tend to be green to gray to olive color to brown. It tends to have a big spectrum. And so I'm trying to give you more what are those unique markings you need to look for. And in the wood frog, that mask around its eyes. But the best way to really identify the wood frog is its call. So I want you to listen to its call. And if you feel comfortable doing so, type into the chat what you hear when you hear this call, all right? So a lot of times people say, yeah, the typical ribbit, great. I love that, Fritz. Yeah, the typical ribbit, uh, ducks quacking, sometimes people say this, or a chuck, 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 chuck sound. Um, I've heard it described as a DJ skipping a record. So if you think of DJs, that duh, 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 duh sound. Um, so this one, I hear it's really common to hear it. Uh, I heard it a lot this spring. So again, listen for one more second, just so you can identify that wood frog again. All right, so that was our wood frog. Next frog in our group of true frogs is our northern leopard frog. So this would be bigger than our wood frog, so he can get up to four and a half inches. So 
size of that top of the uh, lid container for maybe your drink at McDonald's or something. They also tend to live in more marshes, bogs, fens, not as much in the vernal pool. So that's one difference between these two. April and May is more their breeding month. So you would hear this guy right now. Um, an important unique marking for the leopard frog. So leopard, you think of spots for leopards, but the spots for the leopard frog, they tend to have a random pattern. They also tend to be more light colored. You can't really tell it in this picture. Uh, you can see that, that, that ridge right here that I was talking about earlier in frogs, but around the spots, it tends to be more like a yellowish or whitish color around the spots. And that's a really good identifying characteristic because I'm going to show you another one that is spotted as well, but different in just a bit. So look for those spots, but more random spots for the northern leopard frog. All right, so the sound of the northern leopard frog, very different than the wood frog. So again, I want you to listen and see if you can try to figure out what it sounds like to you. All right, so it's really hard to get recordings that are just one frog, just going to point that out. But you could have, you should have heard that deep rattling snore with a little bit of like chuckling at the end. Um, so it's kind of the snore and the chuck, 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 chuck at the end. So let's listen to that one again. It's, as I said, very different than the previous one. So you should hear the rattling snore and then that chuck, chuck, chuck at the end. All right, did you hear that, how it went up? The snore and the chuck, chuck, chuck kind of at the end. So the one that the northern leopard frog can sometimes be confused with is the pickerel frog, all right? So this one's a little smaller. So this one only gets up to three inches, whereas the northern leopard got up to four and a half. Similar habitats, swamps, bogs, fens, ponds. Same breeding time. So breeding months are April and May. This one though is of special concern in Michigan, so you're probably not going to see it as much because it's pretty rare to find it. But if you look at the spots, the spots tend to be more squarish shape. So it also has spots, but they're more squarish, kind of in rows down its back. And they also tend to be more outlined in black. So the previous one were more outlined in lighter colors. This is more outlined in darker colors, more blackish. So those are the characteristics that you want to look for. They also tend to be a little bit more browner in color, but again, there's variation in color. So I'd look for those squarish spots uh, and the brown spots. So the call of this one, you should notice that it will be different. Hopefully you do, but listen carefully and see if you can identify some characteristics that will help you remember what it sounds like. This one reminds me of my father a little bit. So it still has the snore that that leopard frog had. So they both snore as well, even they, though they looked the same or pretty similar, they also both have a snore. But remember the leopard frog has that kind of chuck, chuck, chuck at the end. Um, some people sometimes say that it also sounds like it's turning on a lightsaber. So if you really love Star Wars, uh, if you think of the sound of turning on that lightsaber, um, and it's shorter than the leopard frog, not as loud as the leopard frog, even though it was pretty loud on the recording. Um, so it's a low sustained growling is what you're thinking of when you're thinking of the pickerel. If you do hear this one, great, I love that. But listen to it one more time so you know what you're listening for. Definitely tired. All right, so here's my first quiz for you. Which is the leopard frog? 
Is it the one on the left or is it the one on the right? So I just showed you two frogs that kind of looked like a leopard frog. Uh, is the leopard frog the one on the left or the one on the right? Feel free to put it in the chat. You can put an L or an R. Uh, but I hope you can identify these a little bit more by sight. Yes, you've got it. Definitely, it's the one on the right. You can see the spots aren't as squarish and they more have a yellowish uh, outline to them, whereas this one has more of a black one. Awesome, great. All right, let's go on to our mink frog. This is our fourth frog. Uh, you're making your way through your frogs of Michigan. These guys get up to three inches, so about the same size as the last frog we saw, the pickerel frog, but they only live in our northern latitude, so they really only live in the Upper Peninsula. So we shouldn't see these guys down south. Um, there's always rare things, I guess, that could happen, but these guys tend to only live up in the Upper Peninsula. Their breeding months are June and July, so later in the season, much later than what we're thinking right now. Uh, they also have dark splotches or spots along their back and sides, no ridges. Um, sometimes they are compared to green frogs a little bit, uh, but none of those spotting that you saw for the pickerel or the leopard frog. And the call of this one, let's see what you guys think it is. So people equate this one uh, to horses hooves on cobblestone streets. Uh, that's the best description there is uh, for this one. I have never heard this one in the wild because I haven't been to the UP. Um, but listen again and see if you can hear those cobblestones and the horses hooves. And of course, there's another frog in the background of that one, which would be this frog, uh, our green frog. So our green frog kind of looks similar to our mink frog, right? Uh, but it has this ridge right here. Remember I talked about that ridge on its back. Some frogs have them, some do not. Uh, the green frog has it, the mink frog does not. But the green frog, this is a confusing name because it can be green, it can be yellowish, it can be brown, it can have spots on it. Um, it tends to have some dark spots on, on its hind legs and on its back. Uh, so green frogs are not always green in color. Very important to, to point out. Uh, but they are really easy to identify by their sound. So listen to their sound for just a minute. Yes, banjo. Yep. So the twang of a banjo string or a rubber band plucking, it's usually just one note uh, for the green frog. So you may hear the green frog, unfortunately, with lots of other things. But that one note, that banjo or that rubber band is what you're listening for. Um, so that one, for me, if I think of Kermit the Frog and his banjo, that's the easiest way for me to think of the green frog because uh, Kermit's green what I think of for a green frog, even though it's not always true. So we're gonna hear it one more time. There's that rubber band. All right, so which is the green frog? One of these is a mink frog. One of these is a green frog. So if you remember what I said, the difference is that the left or the right is the green frog. And you can put, as I said, either an L for left, an R for right, but which is the green frog? Yep, that L left, uh, it's got that ridge down its back. That's what you're looking for, for that green frog, that ridge right there. And you can see the mink frog does not have it, even though they look pretty similar. All right, so our American bullfrog. This is our big guy, he can get up to eight inches. This is the biggest guy we have. Um, they tend to like 
ponds, lakes, marshes, slow moving streams. So they need to have enough water for their tadpoles to overwinter because these guys, their tadpoles overwinter. Um, they have unique markings in the sense of they tend to be green to brown, but they have that large eardrum right here, as you can see, right behind its eye. They do not have that ridging. They almost, it's like the ridge kind of goes around their ear in a way, if you see it right here. That's what you're looking for. So they don't have that ridge that that green frog would have. Uh, so if you find a slightly smaller bullfrog and uh, a full grown green frog, remember they don't have that ridge. Listen. So when I think of the call of the bullfrog, I e either think of race cars around a racetrack. So every time they're getting close to you, to you they, they kind of get a little louder. So they're room, room, or a vacuum cleaner. Those are the ones that I think of. Sometimes think people think of jug a rum, jug a rum. Uh, but those are the easiest ways for me to think of the bullfrog. So the recording that I have, again, it's hard to get a recording without other things, but listen for those cars around a racetrack or the ideas of um, the vacuum cleaner. Definitely some green frogs in there too with the, the banjo. All right, so as I said, green frogs tend to have the ridge. American bullfrog, no ridge. They tend to have that ridge more around the ear right there. And you can see it right here again, and then the ridge. So here's my quiz. Which is the bullfrog? Is the one here on the left? Or is it the one here on the right? One is a bullfrog, one is a green frog. As I said, if you get smaller bullfrogs and bigger green frogs, they may look somewhat similar. So which one do you think is the bullfrog? One on the right or the one on the left? All right, looks like people have voted. It is definitely the one actually on the right. Uh, the one on the right is our bullfrog. As I said, no ridge. Uh, the ridge just goes around that eardrum. This is the green frog. All right, so who am I? We've gone through all of our true frogs now. This is a frog that I found last year. I wasn't sure exactly what it was right away, ironically, um, but I want you to listen and look at this frog. So I got some close-up shots and also a little bit of sound and see if you can identify this frog that was found in the wild. All right, so there were a few characteristics that you should have seen. And let me see if I can back up to them. So you should see kind of almost, it looks like a mask right here. And the sound really threw me off. Uh, the sound threw me off so much that I was like, what is that? But you kind of heard like a chuck, 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 chuck sound. So you should have guessed a wood frog. Yeah, wood frog. So uh, it was not happy that I was there. It was kind of scared. So which is why I was a little confused by the sound. Uh, but definitely looking and seeing that mask helped. So all right, so those were our six true frogs. You had your mink, your green, your bullfrog, your wood frog. Uh, I'm forgetting the other two, right? Pickerel and leopard frog. There we go. Those are our six. Now we're going to go on to our tree frogs. Again, there are six different tree frogs. Uh, and these are tree frogs and their relatives. Uh, they tend to have longer limbs. Um, they tend to have large toe pads and they tend to climb really, really well. So that's some of the characteristics for this group. So our first one, you should have heard quite a bit. This was my favorite frog coming in the spring, our Northern Spring Peeper. So these guys, they can fit on your thumb. That's how small these guys are. Uh, they love our vernal pools as well as other wet areas. 
they tend to be one of those first frogs you, you hear in the spring. So March and April, uh, you may still hear them now. They're gonna be pe petering out just a little bit by now. Uh, their unique marking and is a little hard to see on this one, but they tend to have more of an X shape on their back. So that's what you're looking for in their, your unique marking. So most people know this one, but I'm gonna play their sound just a second. And true to their name, they peep. Man, most people, when they don't know their frogs, this is what they think of when they're thinking, oh, that must be lots of birds. Um, but ascending, high ascending peep, um, lots of chicks peeping. Sometimes people say it resembles jingling of sleigh bells uh, when you get lots of them in the chorus. I just think of chicks peeping. Uh, so those are our spring peepers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because most people know these guys, but also really, really, really small. Uh, only a half, up to an inch and a half is how big these guys get, which is why for me, it's really hard to visually see them, but I hear them all the time. So we'll hear them peep one more time. All right, let's get into another favorite of mine. These are Western chorus frogs. So in Michigan, we actually have two different types of chorus frogs. This is where you get that discrepancy uh, between whether we have 13 frogs in Michigan or 14 frogs in Michigan. So according to Michigan's websites, uh, there's different ones, but the Michigan DNR, we have the Western chorus frog, which is one of them. These guys like our vernal pools. They tend to breed in March, April, and May. They're pretty common, very common at the Institute. They'll have the three dark stripes on their back. Um, sometimes people think they have a white strip on their upper lip. But again, these guys are the size of your thumb. They're really, really small, just like our spring peepers. Um, but listen to their sound and listen and see what you think it sounds like. You should have heard some peepers in there because they'll call at the same time. But it should kind of sound like the um, rubbing your thumbnail over a comb, if you've ever done that. Some people say it has a creak sound that'll last about two seconds, but that's that rubbing that finger around along the comb that you think of when you think of that Western chorus frog, all right? So really common, definitely common around the Institute. I've heard, heard them quite a bit recently, uh, but Think of that comb, and I'm going to play it one more time because I'm going to compare it in just a minute to something else. Good swing papers, of course. So this is the one that has that discrepancy. So we had the Western chorus frog. Now we have the boreal chorus frog. Boreal chorus frog really only lives, according to many sources that you read, on Isle Royale, which is why sometimes people don't say that it is one of Michigan's frogs. I count Isle Royale as part of Michigan, so I'm going to include it. Uh, it's the other chorus frog in Michigan, not as common, obviously. They look really similar. So if you're just looking at them, some people say they have shorter hind legs when hopping, uh, that they have a green, more green striping on their back. But if I'm looking at these two, they're the same size and they're really hard to tell. They are of special concern in Michigan. So Michigan Natural Features Inventory does consider this a Michigan frog or toad species. They also have that similar sound as the Western chorus frog. However, it tends to be a little bit longer or slower, All right, So I'm gonna play the sound and I want you to see if you can hear the difference. sound pretty similar, don't they? That's why it's really hard to tell the differences between these two. And so if you'd ever do frog surveying, um, unless you've really got a visualization on the boreal chorus frog, most people are gonna assume it's the Western chorus frog. So that is our discrepancy frog of whether it's actually in Michigan or not. 
All right. Another species that is actually threatened in Michigan. So the last one was of special concern. The boreal one is of special concern. Blanchard's crooked frog is actually threatened in Michigan. Basically, there's really not that many of them. Um, it's the same size as our spring peeper, same size as our chorus frogs. So up to that one and a half inch, there he is on fingers. Uh, tends to live in bogs, ponds, and fens. So really not in your vernal pools. Their breeding time tends to be a little bit later than the other frogs that we just mentioned. So May, June, and July, they tend to be more of a warty skinned frog. Uh, so in that sense, sometimes they may get confused with the toad because we think of toads as more, more warty, uh, but they do have a dark triangle mark and you can kind of see in this picture down here between their eyes on the top of their head. If you do see this frog, please report it to the Michigan Natural Features Inventory because they will want to know if you can find this frog. Um, this frog, listen to it and see what you hear for this frog sound. If I didn't know that was a frog, I might have identified it as a frog. Um, sometimes people think of them as a series of clicks or like rocks or marbles being tapped together or rubbed together. It should start slowly and then increase in speed. Uh, you might hear these frogs more than you would see them if you even hear them. So let's listen to that sound one more time to really get into your head what that sounds like. <laughs> Very unique. All right, so our 11th and 12th frogs. So these are the last of these tree frog group. Uh, these guys are bigger than the other ones. So you can get up to two and a half inches. Um, and I say the gray tree frogs because there is the Eastern gray tree frog that we have here in Michigan, as well as the copes. Uh, they look so similar. I'm giving you pictures that could be either one here. Uh, so they tend to live in our swamps and our ponds, breeding months, April, May, right now. They can be greenish gray and gray to black, depending on their background. These guys are camouflage experts. Uh, so they may say the gray tree frog, just like the green frog, but they can change their color. Uh, they tend to have more of a mottled pattern, kind of resembling lichen in a way. Lichen can be lots of colors. These guys can be lots of colors. Uh, but listen to their sound and see what you think their sound sounds like. All right, so there's definitely some peepers in there, uh, but you should have heard more of a trill, all right? So the Eastern tends to be more of a hearty trill, they call it, uh, lasts about a second. The copes, tends to be more of an angry drill. Uh, and the last it will be a lot faster and harsher. So I'm gonna play a different recording here for just a second. And it'll say which one comes first and which one comes second. So you can hear the difference between the two. And really their sound is the only way to tell the difference between these two. First the copes, then the Eastern. So the copes was a lot harsher or angrier, and that was that first one, and then you got a lighter trill for the eastern. A lot of times people tend to say, I find more eastern gray tree frogs, but again, if it's that harsher, they might be misidentifying them. So there's the cope. Oh, there we go. All right, so our last family that we're going to talk about today are our true toads. So we've talked about frogs this whole time. We only have two toads in Michigan, so it should be easy to identify them, right? Uh, they tend to be thick, dry, warty skinned frogs, but remember the Blanchard's cricket frog was also kind of warty. Uh, more of a stout body, more, more stout here. Uh, moves in short hops, typical of a frog, or excuse me, of a toad. And they have those glands, those poisonous glands, right at their shoulder region. So those are the, some of the identified characteristics for our toads. So we're gonna do the Eastern. American toad first. 
Uh, these guys get as big as a leopard frog, so about four and a half inches. They like your vernal pools, marshes, swamps, basically any wetland area they'll love. Uh, breeding months now, April, May, June, so the longer breeding time than some of our other frogs we've talked about. And they have those large oval glands behind, they say behind their eyes, it's kind of, there's their eye, there's the gland right here. Um, and large warts on their hind legs right back here. But you can really see the gland right here. They can sometimes be more reddish, which is why when I try to give colors, colors are hard in my opinion in frogs and toads, but they can have more of a reddish color as well. So our American Eastern toad, listen to the call and tell me what it sounds like to you. Kind of reminded me of those tree frogs, right? That trill, but with the American toad, that trill is much longer. It can last up to 30 seconds and it's like a soprano, really high and really long. So if you're out in the field and you hear a trill, if it's a short trill, it could be a tree frog. So it could be the Eastern or the Cope's tree, uh, tree frog, gray tree frog. If it is a long trill, it is probably your American toad. All right, so those are the frogs that do more of the trill. So let's listen to it one more time to that trill so you know the difference. Long trill, I'm not gonna play it for 30 seconds, but it's a long trill. So our last frog, number 14, is our fowler's toad, our last frog or toad, excuse me. So these guys are smaller, so only about three and three quarters, almost about four inches uh, in length, uh, a little bit smaller than our American toad. Uh, also lots of different wetlands, but these guys are only found in lower Michigan. So if you remember there was the mink one was only found in upper, these guys are only found in the lower peninsula. Their breeding months are May, June, and July. They also have a long gland over their shoulder and it actually connects to the bony crest on their head. So kind of hard to see in the pictures, but this is kind of a drawing of it. There's the gland, there it is. Uh, also warty, not as warty on its hind legs as the American toad, not as reddish, um, but they are rare and of special concern in Michigan. And I can tell you right now, they do not have a trilling sound at all. Uh, so a very different call than our American toad. So listen to this sound and tell me what it sounds like to you. So you may say that's a trill, but uh, some people call it a short scream, similar to a goat screaming. Harsh and unmusical is another way of describing it. Some people call the American toads as very musical trill, and this one as very unmusical, uh, but it's very harsh sounding, um, almost screaming like. Uh, and I apologize to your ears, but I am gonna play it one more time so you can hear it one more time and get that in your brain. So let's test your skills. What do you hear? So this is uh, in a vernal pool. So that'll give you a little bit of an indication. These are, this is a video that was taken in a vernal pool. And I want you to hear, there are a couple of frogs in here. So I want you to see if you can identify which frogs you hear. With a human child, of course. All right. so. What frogs do you hear? Feel free to put them in the chat. There were at least two frogs that I heard. Maybe you heard others. I'm gonna play it one more time and the frogs will pop up this time. Oh, there we go. So you should have heard a little bit of the peeping, peep, 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 as well as the, uh, quacking ducks, whatever you want to call it, of the wood frog or the chuck, 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 of the wood frog. So those are the two that uh, really love our vernal pools in early spring. So this was taken in early spring just this year. 
All right, there is never just one frog or toad in a pond. So let's try that again. Here's one that's also was taken at the Institute, not this year, another year. So you should have heard at least two different frogs. Um, sometimes people say they hear peepers. I don't hear peepers in those one personally, but if you do, that's okay. We're gonna play it one more time and the frogs should pop up of the ones that I hear in it. Let's see if you hear the same ones. So you should have heard the wood as well as the chorus. The chorus was the one that the fingernail rubbing against the comb, whereas the uh, wood would have been that tick, 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 tick sound. So depending on where you live in Michigan, you may have different frogs call at different times. So these are just two examples. Zone one, which would be where we live in Barrie County. Zone four would be really high in the Upper Peninsula. And if you look at these two zones, in zone one, so the lower peninsula of frogs, they tend to call a lot earlier, usually March in the lower, April in the upper. Uh, they also tend to stop their calling earlier. So they stop calling in about June versus July in the upper peninsula. Another thing that is interesting to note, uh, remember I said some frogs only live in the UP or some frogs only live in the lower peninsula. So in the um, lower peninsula, we have Blanchard's cricket frog, even though that it is a little bit more rare. Uh, and in the upper peninsula, they have the mink frog. You might also notice that the time to call for some of these frogs that call later can be longer in the lower peninsula and shorter in the upper. In the upper, it tends to be just over a month, where in the lower peninsula, it can be basically two full months. So just something to think about on where you are it can make a difference on when things are going to be calling and what are gonna be calling. Uh, so this is kind of our timeline in a way of some of the more common frogs. If you wanna to listen to this sometime, I will encourage you to go onto YouTube. Uh, I am gonna give you this PowerPoint when we're done. And so you can click on this link later, but you notice the wood frogs, the chorus frogs, the spring peepers tend to come out earlier. And then your green frogs and your American bullfrogs will come out later. About now, more or less, is where you're going to get the overlap of lots of different frogs. Coarse frogs, peepers, leopard frogs, American toads, your tree frogs. You can even start getting your green frogs, um, which can get confusing sometimes when you're trying to listen to all of them. So it's never just, unfortunately, one frog or toad. But once you really start internalizing those different sounds of the frogs and toads, it'll get easier in order to identify them. So how do we observe and identify our frogs and toads? Well, you can observe them, binoculars, photography, listen to them, get up close. If you do get up close, uh, try to stay a little bit away from the edge of the wetland if possible. Try to go out when there's a low wind speed so you can actually hear the calls uh, and use your, what I like to call your deer ears. So cup your hands around your ears to help hear those frogs better because some of them have a really soft call. Remember also the factors that influence the call. So the time, where you are, the temperature, if it's uh, a lot colder, they may not be calling as much. Also, it's great to go after a rain or going at sunset, but you don't wanna go when it's too late out because after midnight, they tend to stop calling. So some resources, how to know your frog and toad calls. Well, there are many descriptions on this PDF here. They'll give you some of the descriptions that I gave here today. You can download MP3 files onto your phone if you would like to do so uh, to help you uh, acclimate your ears to the, all those calls. There's also an app, it's called Frog Sounds Toad Greenhouse Frog app. Um, this one, it's a free app that I found just recently. The pro is that there are quite a few of Michigan's frog and toad calls and that it's free. The con is there's not all Michigan species on here. So there's the uh, plain spadefoot, not in Michigan, uh, but it's another way of getting those calls and getting used to some of the calls on it. You can also use iNaturalist if you see your frog or toad. So iNaturalist is an app that I've talked about before if you have been to any of these other programs. It's a free app. 
It's great for taking a picture of what you see uh, and helping you identify it by taking that picture. And it also helps scientists a lot uh, because by actually recording what we're seeing, scientists can get that data and they can use that data for their research projects. So that's the really good thing. New species have been discovered as a result of this app. The problem is some of these frogs are really small and fast, so it's sometimes hard to take a picture of the frogs. But you can get a account, just need to sign up with it for an e with an email. If you can take a picture of it um, and make sure your picture is good. So sometimes if it's out of focus or it's not the main thing in the picture, it might not be able to help you identify it. But if you can get a good picture, and this is just a picture from a picture, so I didn't get that close, unfortunately, uh, you would just click that camera icon, icon, take a picture, use the photo, uh, and then it'll give you suggestions of what it is. And it says, yes, it's a typical frog or a true frog. Uh, give, it gave actually only three suggestions. Usually it gives 10, but because we don't have a lot of frogs in Michigan, they're probably not going to give you a lot of suggestions. Uh, and they definitely correctly identified it as a green frog. Remember, it's got that ridging down its back. Always a chance to learn. Uh, make sure you also have your location services on with this app because that'll help them identify because remember, mink frogs found in the Upper Peninsula, uh, whereas our, our cricket frogs are usually only found on the Lower Peninsula. But upload the picture and the great thing is people will help you identify it. So if you can't identify it from the picture, maybe someone else can. Uh, it can say it needs ID. And if someone else has helped you, it might even get up to research grade so researchers can use it. We also want to learn how to protect our frog and toad friends. So one way to do that as part of National Amphibian Week, as I said at the beginning of this, is to provide piles of rocks, logs, and leaves in your yard. This is good homes for frogs and toad friends. Great for uh, when they hibernate in the winter, great for finding their food right now. You can also create a compost heap. Again, great for them finding their food, add a pond to your garden. Avoid using pesticides if possible in your lawn because those will be very harmful to our frog and toad friends. If you do handle a frog and choose to handle a frog, just make sure you don't have sunscreen or bug spray on your hands because that can go into the frog and really harm our frog and toad friends. And of course, learn more like you're doing today. There are many frog and toad citizen science or community science projects out there. iNaturalist was one I just mentioned. Um, the global herp mapper is for more global. Michigan herp atlas is more Michigan based. Frog watch uh, is more US based and the Michigan DNR frog and toad survey is again more Michigan based. Um, there's some of them are used as apps. And as I said, this is in your resources. Uh, this is kind of what this app looks like. The con of this app is they don't really go by common names as much. Uh, it's a little clunky, uh, but you can go online to more record what you see, but you do need to know your frogs and toads in order to do this. Uh, Michigan DNR frog and toad survey. Again, you need to know your frog and toads, but you can really help the state of Michigan know what we have. Uh, John Ball Zoo is actually a chapter of the Frog Watch uh, USA because it's zoos and aquariums, uh, and they do training sessions, kind of like what we did today. So that is something else that you can look into. If you want to be part of a project that we're doing at the Institute right now, um, we are trying to identify some of our frogs and toads in Michigan. Uh, so if you want to try using your iNaturalist, uh, any frogs and toads you find in the state of Michigan this next week, we will be recording in our project. So it's just a project we have going on. Uh, you don't have to sign up for the project. If you do, you can use this little uh, URL down here. If you don't, your recordings will still be recorded in the project. If you want to find the project, you go under iNaturalist, under projects, it's called the Other Songs of Spring. This is the link to this presentation, as well as lots of different resources. And I hope you learned something about our frog and toad friends. So thank you so much for joining me today.